in prayer. And Brendan, would you ask God to bless, please, the offering? Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to be in your house tonight, Lord. Bless this offering we're about to receive, Lord God. Bless the use of it, Lord, for your honor. And glory. I pray that you just bless Brother Hardman tonight. Bless each and every soul here tonight, Lord God, and those that are listening. Lord, we just pray that your word will go forth with power and your Holy Spirit will fill us all, Lord God, and just draw us closer to you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Hardman, you come to the altar. We'll get a bunch of us guys to pray over you before you preach. You know, it was cute the other night. Little Titus was up here praying with the guys. I think Brenda got a picture of, of him up here praying. We got some young men up here, too. They know the importance of this. Rich, would you ask God to bless us? Father, we thank you for your love and mercy, and once again, we thank you for Brother Hardman. His travels, Lord, we thank you for his messages. Lord, we ask that you give him uh, your special touch tonight. We pray that you'll help each one of us to also receive that special touch from his words. Lord, help us to hear from you tonight, not just as a church, but as individuals. Lord, I, I pray that you'll, uh, that you'll bless this church with continued growth in many years. God bless you, preacher. God bless you. Amen. All right. Good to see you all tonight. Glad to be seen. Praise the Lord. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Been at this thing a few days now. We've looked at many things thus far, and we can say this tonight. We don't have but five more to do. We'd already got the first week over with already. I just got here. We just got started on this thing here. Now we're just we just got in by five. So we gotta make we gotta make these last five real important. Because these last five are what I'm gonna leave you with. This is what you'll remember. These last five you'll remember more because they'll be fresher in your mind. But I do pray that you won't forget what you've already heard. God has been kind enough to come visit us. Well, one night especially he visited us, did he not? And, and uh, put some help on some of our, our families and our people. And we thank God for that. What a great blessing that is. I want to bring you a thought tonight, plus illustrate it if I may. And uh, you know that uh, campfire message I brought to you the other day with that steak. Uh, as you have your little weenie roast and whatever you do all summer, maybe you'll remember that. Yeah. Maybe. I pray you do. I pray every time you see something like this someplace, you'll remember that it's a, a picture of you. You're a vessel of God, and you need to be a good one. Not just be uh, an ornament on a shelf. All right? You need to be usable for God Almighty. You and I all need to be usable in these last days. 
for the world around us is crumbling, as Jesus wrote down 2,000 years ago, what we'd be living in right now. And it's right before our very eyes. I mean, you just can't even listen to the news without seeing bits and pieces of the Bible coming true right in our very, very presence. Our Savior's on his way back to get us. I don't know when he's coming, okay? I ain't like them idiots. I don't know when he's coming. All I know is I get to go when he comes, and I thank God for that. Amen. And if he comes tonight while we're at church, I don't want none of you left behind. You got to add, I don't want you left here. You think it's bad now. Wait till the Holy Ghost is pulled off the earth. See, that's who takes us home. We couldn't get through this atmosphere of demons without the Holy Ghost. So it's the Holy Ghost going to hear that shout. You and I are going to hear it. And we're leaving. Go home and be with God. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Can you stand? Let me read you these three verses again. You got any bits and pieces of this in your mind left? Huh? Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house... There are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. The men have prayed, and I thank you for that. You may be seated, dear church. You may be seated. I was thinking this morning, I, I spend a lot of time uh, in silence. Uh, you loved ones have to work, and you've got a thousand irons in the fire. I understand all of that. Uh, but my, my main work is what you're looking at now. And so I spend my mornings, most of the time I spend all my mornings with God in the book, talking to him, asking him questions, in my mind and my heart, Mama's doing her stuff, different things that she does all the time. And after we have our family devotions every day, read our Bible together, pray. Then I read my CD full of Bible every morning. When I get done with all that, then I go to God and I say, God, now what are we going to do? And today, God said, this is what I want for tonight. You know, this old world's chaotic. It's got a lot of pressure to it. There's a lot of uh, folks that are struggling now uh, with a lot of different issues of their life. And, and it seems like there's a lot of our church people, now maybe not so much in here now after a week of what God has been doing, but before church started this last week or so, maybe somebody in here just felt like they'd been poked or maybe stepped on or, or beaten on a little while. And sometimes in, in life, uh, there are certain things that just continue to add up on us and add up on us and add up on us, and, and it kind of knocks the spirit out of us. And we get a little lax and we get a little whatever, and uh, we're not as zealous as we was before, and we're not as powerful as we was before. We're not, we're not the the vessel necessary that God wants us to be. Uh, I've got a brother down in Florida. His wife has had cancer, bad, 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 bad cancer for years now. And uh, she's had all kinds of surgeries. I mean, tell you, I mean, I think the girl's hollow myself. I, there can't be anything left in her because she had cancer everywhere and they cut it all out. And uh, I talked to him the other day and uh they was hoping to move out of Florida, move to Tennessee, if she was on, the, say, the, the end of her treatments or, or where she could at least maybe uh, transfer and do what she's doing as they moved. And the doctor told him that she's got three more years there of it. 
And for years now, my brother has said, that's another punch in the stomach. It's another kick in the teeth. For years he's been saying that, ever since he went sick. And there are times in your life and my life that it seems like it's just piling up on us. And we just run out of steam. We run out of get-go. We run out of power. We run out of that which motivates us to go. You, uh, you loved ones, I don't see that problem here, but uh, there are a few that, that ain't been here for a few days, and, and uh, I don't know that this is their problem, but I'm just saying churches all over the place are, are hemorrhaging. Are you listening to me? They're hemorrhaging people, and you go to talk to them, and they're just absolutely out of air, out of hope, out of power, out of willpower, out of everything that, that keeps you and I going. They, they seem to be out of it. I'll give you a verse or two, then we'll get into it. Ready? The Lord Jesus in John 14 said, Let not your heart be troubled. Amen. Now that happens to be a command. Amen. <laughs> and if you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. But don't get in despair. God Almighty knows you're human. Amen. And so when he said, Let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. So there's our salvation. Then in the second verse, he said something of this like. He said, uh, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I'd have told you. That's our eternity. We're saved in verse 1, and we got eternity waiting on us in verse 2. And a lot of times, we take our eyes off of all of that, and we're so on this level that we get down, out to where we get this idea, well, at least thank God I'm saved, but we're not happy about it. We, we, find, we find our Savior, my dear family, dealing with men that are of the same likeness as you and I. The Lord Jesus Christ, my dear family, was the vessel of hope for his men. He's the vessel of hope for all men. But I'm telling you, for his few men that he had traveling with him, they were, they were just like you and I. They got jealous of each other. They run their mouth. They did everything like all of us all do, you know what I'm saying? But, but he, was their, he was their vessel of hope. He stirred them on and, and, and kept them going. And then when he left in Acts chapter 1, he made sure that they was not without and he sent the Holy Ghost down to be their vessel of hope inside. You and I are saved by the grace of God, isn't that right? In that salvation, my dear family, we have an inner hope that we sometimes cover up with the trash of life. The circumstances of life, the oh, woe is me of life. And a lot of times, my dear one, uh, we're, we're not... We're not really damaged. We're just deflated. In being deflated, we're not as usable as we're supposed to be. We're just kind of flat. Not all the way flat. Because we're kept by the power of God. But just deflated to the point where we just don't bounce good no more. And, and if, if we try to, you know, be a joy to somebody, we're, we're so self-down that we can't even help someone else lift up and now. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And so now they're flat and I'm flat. And pretty soon this one's negative and that one's negative. And she said, Preacher, what are you trying to tell me? Well, I want to take two or three pieces of Bible and show you 
these guys right here, okay? And, and I want you tonight to understand that this is not the end. Go to 1 Samuel 22. 1 Samuel 22, let me show you a group of men, a vessel of hope. Let me show you a man that had been in this position himself. Every one of us have not been on the mountaintop since the day of salvation. There have been valleys. There have been briar patches. There's no telling what will knock the air out of you. Could be disease. I remember being down for a year and a half in that old crazy chair of mine, taking treatments. Weak as a cat, couldn't stay awake to save my life. Nearly, listen, this is nuts. You ready for this nuts? Nearly every thought made me cry. And I hated to be a sissy. I'm a man. Men cry, don't get me wrong. But we put a, a, a video on or something, we don't have a TV. We, we put a video on or something, you know, to, to, to watch uh, some good thing and, 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 and somebody would do something really great. And I'd sit there and cry and sob and bawl like a baby. And I'd tell her, I said, don't put them on that cry baby movies in. I, I don't, I'll sit there and of course she don't help me. No, she, are you crying? <laughs> I was deflated. Doc, can I go back to work? No, preacher. You cannot give back in public. You've got no immune system. You've got no way to fight off anything. If you catch anything, you're dead. Yeah, but preacher, but Doc, you don't understand. I got work to do. He said, Not now, you don't. I finally talked him into it. Would you believe it? I went back to church, preached. The next week I was in the hospital near dead. Septic. He didn't say a word. He just looked at me. <laughs> Deflated. Messed up. Of course, you know the enemy of my soul and what he was saying. Well, useless. How are we going to do today? Well, of no value no more, what we're going to do now? You can't even stay awake long enough to get a prayer through. I mean, that rascal was on me like white on rice. I was down, deflated. I tried everything in my power to keep the air up. But every time I did, it seemed like a knife. Went inside and twisted and knocked the air back out of me again. And I had to spend a lot of time with God. God, I'm down. God, I'm messed up. God, my, listen, God, this chemo's got my mind crazy. God, I got, God in heaven, I got chemo brain. Now, I don't want chemo brain, God. God, you got to restore my brain. You got to put back in my brain, God. God in heaven, I can't remember Bible verses. I can't remember what I've been preaching. God in heaven, I can't remember this. I can't, God in heaven, you got to, and I begged God, I pleaded with God, and I laid at the feet of God. Amen. I had no other recourse. Had a great wife taking good care of me. I got my own Dr. Laura right there. Amen. Amen. She taking good care of me. I mean, I had no want of anything. But inside, I had the stuffings knocked out of me. When that doc finally said, you're cured. There ain't a sign of cancer nowhere. You can go back to your work. I wouldn't lie to you. Save your life. I said, I want to pray, but I couldn't pray for sobbing. I was crying and praising God in my heart and mind so good. I finally got my faculties back, and I prayed for the doctor and thanked him for what he did and how God had helped him help me, and on and on and on. And, and we went out of there, and boy, the first time I got behind the pulpit after I was sick, you're right, I just stood there and cried. Amen. It was so good to be home. Amen. See, this is home. To me, the pulpit of the world is home to me. You should preach what you're saying. In First Samuel chapter 22, I want you to see these deflated boys. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Dullam. 
Saul's after him. Everything seems to be going crazy in his life. Every time he turns around, someone else is sticking a knife in him and knocking air out of him. And when his brethren and all of his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress, <laughs> everyone that had a calamity, everyone that had a, had a misery about them, everyone that had a misfortune about them, see, my dear family, they seemed hopeless. David, the great man, had, had the enemies after him and, and uh, they were trying to kill him and trying to take him out of the picture just like the enemy of your soul was trying to do to you. Yeah. And every once in a while, he'll find somebody come along and stick a knife in you and deflate you a little bit, take the air out of you. Because when the air is out of you, you're not near as useful as you was when you was full of air. Not, you can't bounce as, as high. You can't, you can't do as good. And a lot of times uh, the deflated uh, somebody's my dear family are like these men here, distressed. The Bible says they was in debt. The Bible says they were discontented, not satisfied. A lot of church members are in this situation right here. Amen. And it wasn't, listen to me closely now, stay with me now. It was not the church that did it to them. There are times... When things happen at church and it knocks the air out of you. We've been in church services like that where, where I mean, it just absolutely busts you down. I was in a church in West Virginia where the, they come in Sunday morning and, and kick the pastor out right in front of everybody. Well, he, I mean, he went down flat. I mean, he was ruined. He said, Preacher, what, what do you do when it comes like that? I'll get to that in a little while. I want you to realize something about that family, a deflated church member. <laughs> It's hard for the pastor to keep going. He don't, he don't roll like he's supposed to roll. He don't function like he's supposed to function. He'll land on a flat spot and stop. The preacher's got to prod him on and encourage him on and push him on and try to get him to go on a little further. Try it again tomorrow, brother. It'll be all right. Try it again tomorrow, sis. It'll be all right. And we know it's true, but we are so... Down, we don't see tomorrow as a victory. We see tomorrow as another day of defeat. Another day of not going to make it. Another day of not able to function scripturally, uh, Christian-wise, like I want to do. An unsatisfied person of God, my dear family, they seem to be hopeless. David was a vessel of hope for these men. Now I want you to see this closely, if you will. The Bible says there was 400 of them, verse 2. And the Bible says that he became captain over them. So preacher, what are you saying? Even the down and outers, spiritually speaking, need someone to lead them. When we're this way, we can't think spiritually. We only think physically. When our, when our debts are over our heads, when our sicknesses we can't seem to get well, when it seems like stress and problems and the load is just too much, we need a David. Miss Ashley's got her own David. Ain't that good? <laughs> we need a David, a vessel of hope, to come into our scene here, and, and if nothing else, to carry us through the moment. By the way, my love, it is only but a moment. And what you've got to understand, what I've got to understand, when we get like this, and we all get like this sometimes. Come on now. We need somebody to come along and say, listen, it'll be okay after a while. Yeah, I don't know if it will be or not. Yeah, but God Almighty said, let not your heart be troubled. Amen. Are you saved? Amen. Are you God's child? Do you belong to Jesus Christ? Well, yes, but it just seems like the whole world's caving in around me. Yeah. But don't worry about it. In my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not sort of told you, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Right. You're saved by the grace of God, and you got a place in heaven. This world's not our home. 
We may be like this for a day, but we're not like this forever. We belong to God Almighty. We're in the hand of God Almighty. Hey, we're in the hand of God, my dear family. It don't matter if you're deflated or not. You're safe in the hand of God. These men with a hope that's so called David. You said, preacher, did it turn out for him? Well, it could have. You say, how you know? Look at 2 Samuel 23. 2 Samuel 23. Now, this is a simple little thought tonight, but I pray you're getting it. I pray you're getting it. 2 Samuel 23. Here's what we find in the Word of God. You ready for this? Look with me, please, in 2 Samuel 23, and I'm going to grab it up in about verse 8. These be the names of the mighty man who David had. The Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino the Esnite. He lifted up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. After him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ohohite, and one of the three mighty men with David when they defiled the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle. The men of Israel were going away. We got, we, got the, we got men here now, my family. Verse 11, after him was Shammah, the son of Aji, the Harite. Philistines were gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. And he stood... In the midst of the ground, defended it, slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. Just one book back, these men are defeated. These men are deflated. These men are messed up. But one book forwards, look what they're doing. The three mighty men, verse 16, break through the host of the Philistines. Hey, a deflated soldier would have never took a chance. These men are no longer deflated. What happened to him? David, the vessel, brought him some hope. But he wouldn't drink it. Imagine that. David would not drink that water because they jeoparded their lives to get him that drink of water. He poured it out as an offering unto God Almighty. So what are you trying to tell me? Verse 18, Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeriah, was chief among the three he lifted up his spear against 300 and slew him and had a name among three. Was he not most honorable of three? Therefore he was their captain. How did he attain not unto the first three? But now the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, he had done many acts. He slew two lion like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit, time of snow. I ain't going to read all this. I'm just telling you about it, family. The same bunch in 1 Samuel 22 is a bunch in 2 Samuel 23. And that crowd was like this when they got up there. But David, my dear family, encouraged them, gave them some hope. And when you get over here on this side of it, you find out this crowd, my dear family, is serving God, loving God, staying with God, protecting David, and doing the job that God had them to do. You should preach away trying to tell me. I'm trying to tell you, love, these vessels, these vessels are usable vessels. But if you let things deflate you, you gotta stop, you gotta stop the deflation. Stay with me now. Stop letting it take the air out of you. Because you're not defeated in totality. We may be like this, but this is not the end. Well, Brother Don, what I got to do? What I got to do? Well, you tell me, my dear family, what do we got to do with this illustration? What could I do to help this old deflated ball do what it's supposed to do? Pump it back up. What do you think we're doing with these meetings? I'm trying to pump you up. Why? So you don't live your life like this, flat on one side and not much use. I want you to be full. So now I'm going to take a few minutes and teach you how to do that. You ready? I'm going to teach you how to be a filled vessel of God Almighty. I want you to realize that you are a valuable property 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. You could get back to doing what God Almighty intended you to do. Bounce high, roll good. Are you listening to me? He said, Preacher, how do you get back to that honorable vessel in the usage of God Almighty? How do you get back to that point, Preacher? How do you, how do, you do what you're telling me to do? I feel like that. Are you ready? Even after this week and plus of what we've been through of this last week, how many of you are still deflated? This is how. My soul. Thank you for being honest. Not much use in your own mind. Maybe even such as a little dishonorable. Others are fired up and ready to go and doing things, but you just you just don't feel like you you fit. You don't feel like you belong. You don't feel like you're an asset any longer. I don't want to say this, but I'm gonna do it anyhow because I love you. Y'all believe I do? Y'all believe I love you? Surely to goodness, you're not contemplating leaving, are you? Because you've been deflated by some circumstance. Outside the church or in. You said, preacher, but I just, I just don't feel like ought to. And, and maybe if I went somewhere else, I wouldn't quench the spirit at Seneca Bible. But don't give me that stuff. Don't even get near me with an attitude like that. I'll stomp you down the ground. <laughs> Grieve the spirit if you... You don't help me, God. <laughs> this is where you want to get to. This is where you are. I'm going to give you a Bible on how to get to this. I want you to be the honorable vessel. Listen to me closer. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Are you saved? Amen. Then are you an honorable vessel? Yes. Did God sacrifice his son to save you? Do you have any value? Yes. Yes. Look at me in your Bible. To 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is what God's Bible says. I'm going to show you by God's Bible how to get inflated again and get back to where you're supposed to be in the attitude. In the attitude. You've let circumstances of life or, or something deflate you and make you to the place. Listen to me right now, gang. Is this like this? Is this a ball? Is this a ball? It may not be quite the same because it's deflated, but it's still a ball. You're still saved. If you're born again, you're still saved. You still belong to God Almighty. You're still useful. You've got to get to this point. See, you bring yourself to Christ, and you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. The Bible says, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Preacher, I, I just feel like the whole world's against me. Welcome to the party. The whole world is against you, but you're not of this world. You belong to God Almighty. You and I are from another world. Amen. We're just visiting down here. We're perplexed. But not in despair. Preacher, I don't, I don't know what to do. Yes, you do. You have a Savior. And that Savior's waiting at the throne for you to come to Him and say, Lord, I don't know what to do. He says, I do. I finally got you to the place where I could help you. You're now not going to do your own on your own. You're going to let me do it. Yep. And when you and I let God do it, boy, how great it is. Persecuted, yep. but not forsaken. Yep. Cast down, but not destroyed. Paul told that Corinth church. You and I, my dear family, are living in a very perilous and troublesome world. 
and, and the news and sickness and poverty and, and all kinds of stuff just, just knocks the air out of us sometimes. But that's the time when God can come to our rescue and say, what I want to do is this. I want to, I want to reinstate. I want to fill you back up. I want to put something in you that will help you get along. I want you, I want you back to your normal use in my hand. Ephesians declares this, Be ye not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Like this old ball here, needs to be filled again with air. So it can be like this ball here. So that both of them, my dear family, will have its function again. And when you and I, my dear family, go back to God, depending on Him, relying on Him, giving ourselves back to Him again, taking our eyes off the circumstances of the world, and giving ourselves back to God Almighty and say, God in heaven, you know what I need? I need field. I've let the world deflate me. I've let the world take the air out of me. I've let the world take my zeal away. I've let the world mess my mind up. I've let problems and circumstances and difficulties work on my mind. God in heaven, I'm tired of them living in my head. I need my head cleared, God. You know what God Almighty said? He said, let this mind be in you. Let me clear your head of all that stuff that's controlling you now. See, that's what being filled with the Spirit is. It's a control factor. He said, preacher, what are you saying? I'm just asking you flat out. Who's controlling you when you're like this? Who might be controlling you when you're like this? Sometimes, my dear family, we in our zeal and experience and education get this idea that we can handle the day. Well, I've discovered in my old age that there ain't no way under the sun I can handle any day. Jesus said in John, without me you can do nothing. 15th chapter of John. By and by, all of you Young people, especially young people, you're going to learn. You know, I'm glad of that because I don't want to do it without him. You're going to get to that point in your Christian life where you're going to say, God, I don't want to go through this day without you. I don't want to go to school without you. I don't want to go to work without you. I don't want to do this without you, God. I want you, God, to fill me with myself. So, God, here's what I'm doing. I'm consecrating myself to you. I'm separating myself unto you. I'm sanctifying myself to you for the master's use. God, fill me back up. Yeah, and, let's be the, and I'm going to tell you why you ain't doing it. You ready? You ain't spending enough time. You expect God to do it instantly. And God says, no, I ain't going to do it instantly. I'm going to see how serious you really are. Are you willing to stay with me a little while and let me fill you back up? Now, I know you've got to go to work, but don't you take God to work with you, fellas? Well, preacher, I can't, just can't get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and, and, and have devotions. Uh, well, don't feel bad. I don't either. But when I do get up, I go straight to God Almighty. And I take God with me every place I go and I ask God to guide and direct and help and, and show me what to do and show me how to talk and show me how to witness and show me how to do whatever it is to do. He said, Preacher, why? Because, love, I can't even breathe without his permission. I can't even see without his permission. I can't even move without his permission. This is the grace of God standing in front of you, gang. I shouldn't even be alive, let alone here, bringing the word of God to my family. God Almighty has blessed me. And every, every time we, we turn around, we're distressed or despaired. But God said, no, you're not in that category. You may be a little deflated, but you're not out. I didn't throw you away. Uh-uh. I refill you. Come on, let me refill you. Get back under my control. Get back in my ways. Get back in my book. Get back in my church. Get back in the work of God. No matter how little it might be, just get back in and do what I intended you to do. And that's to give me pleasure. All things were made and created for the pleasure of God Almighty. Revelation 4 says. You never know he liked to play ball, did you? 
And for you ball players in here, there's nothing wrong with playing ball. As long as it don't take God's place. God didn't throw us away when we mess up, when we let circumstances take the air out of us. We lose our zeal, lose our fire, lose our joy, which is a hard thing to do. If you lose your joy, love, I want you to realize something. That means the Holy Ghost left you. Hi, son. How you doing? Fine. Can the Holy Ghost walk out of you? No. So you ain't never lost your joy. But you can cover it up with a lot of trash. Amen. And it looks like you ain't got it no more. Is that right, says. Rich, why you embarrass people? I ain't embarrassed this boy. <laughs> He's all right. I try to include people in my messages. Can you lose your peace? Come on, stay with me now. Galatians chapter 5, 22nd verse. The fruit of the Spirit is, and there's nine of them, right? Can you lose them? Not unless he leaves. And he said he ain't going to leave. So, Queen Elizabeth, you can't lose You can't lose nothing of the Holy Ghost because he won't move out of you. Now, you can cover it up with a bunch of circumstances, and it looks like you ain't got it no more, and you can get yourself deflated, and you get yourself somewhat defeated, but there is still a God in heaven who says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in me? Do you believe in God? Believe in me. And he takes that same vessel that looks like it ain't worth throwing in the trash. He said, devil, you don't even have no clue what I got there. I've got a treasure. Last night's message, treasure, an earthen vessel. All I need to do is get into where he'll let me inflate him again. And I'll bring him back to where he's supposed to be in my work. And in my realm, and in my home, and in my church, and in my family of God. He said, Put your way, trying to tell me tonight. I'm trying to tell you that I've got a defeated spirit. You're not out. Can you get out of God's hand? John chapter 10. Then why do we act like we are? Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Hang tight with me now. Hang tight. I'm trying to show you how to get back in it. Ephesians chapter 5. This is what God of Eyes Bible says there, and I done quoted the thing to you, but I want you to see it again. Be not drunk with wine when it's excess, but be filled, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Preacher, how could I do that? I told you. Remember when you surrendered to God to be saved? What did you hold back? Come on, let's, let's, let's go back to Salvation Day, right? What did you hold back from God that he would birth you into his family? Well, then why on a daily basis when we're down or discouraged or whatever it might be, why don't we just go right back to God with everything we've got to God, guess what your child's doing? I'm pouting and I'm crying and I'm feeling sorry for myself and nobody loves me. Remember in the Old Testament, there was a fellow went to God. Israel messed up, got, got whooped. He said, Lord, what do we do when Israel turns it back? He said, get up. What are you doing like that for? Well, that's what he does to us. Why are you laying there in doubt? Why are you laying there feeling sorry for yourself? Why do you think everybody's got to cater to you and everything coming and going? Why are you deflated? Why are you sticking your own self with a pen, letting that, your zeal out? You need attention? Do you think you're going to get more attention being flat or being full? 
Well, yeah, but I want them to feel sorry for me. Nobody does, son. You haven't? Nobody does. They're praying for you. They've been there too. Well, I never knew that. That's because they didn't do what you're doing, sissy. They didn't pout and cry and beg and hope somebody feels sorry for them. They come to me. They laid in front of me. And they fested and showed out and said, listen, God, I'm a mess. God, help me. And I inflated them again. I was a vessel of hope to them. I had had some of them go see the preacher. And he was a vessel of hope to them. I even had some of them, they didn't, they didn't want the preacher to know how sorry they was. And so they just discussed it with their spouse. And that spouse was a vessel of hope to them. What you don't know, my son or daughter, is you ain't in this boat by yourself. Every one of my kids goes through these times. And every one of my kids needs a vessel of hope. You know what I want you to do now? I want you to be a vessel of hope for somebody else. Because they're not saying it. But there's folks all sitting around you in the church house. Their, their spirit's knocked out of them. Something's happened. Something's going on. Somebody said something to hurt my little feelings. And they're just not feeling real bad at all. You need a vessel of hope. So I sent that old hillbilly up there to preach on these vessels. And he's trying to show you something tonight. That you're not out. You may be deflated. You may even feel defeated, but you're not thrown away. You're a child of the king. Heads about, eyes are closed. Preacher, that's it? Uh Uh-huh. David's men in 1 Samuel 22 were deflated and defeated. Samuel 23, they were mighty men of God. Let me ask you a question. Which way do you want to be? Yes, we have moments of stress and trouble and difficulties. And it seems like the circumstances of life just flat knock our stuffings out of us. But God Almighty says, come to me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you some rest. I'll reinflate you. Let me back in control of your life. Let me help you again. Let me bless you again. Let me strengthen you again. Let me put you back to the usage that I have for you as a child of God. Come see, Mama. A vessel of hope. Of him I could. Come on, give Christ back the control. 